those are the announcements for today and we're going to go ahead and get started with our reading today in the book of Acts. We're continuing in Acts chapter 8 verses 14 through 25. It's Acts chapter 8 verses 14 through 25. We are going to be picking up in the section where uh, we know that Philip had gone over to Samaria uh, to preach the gospel and speak truth uh, of the gospel and we know that there are going to be other individuals involved here, other people involved. Uh, we're now in the second part of Acts chapter 8 picking up where uh, Peter and John had uh, heard that there was activity in Samaria and there's a lot more to this than if just reading on the surface you when we look at this passage um, there are some very deliberate things that God is doing here and we need to make sure that we're pointing these things out because um, it's easy to make a judgment right away that uh, things aren't happening the way they should be if we have an expectation if a person believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and that the Holy Spirit comes immediately. Well, in this particular section, we're going to see some things that are very interesting within this transition, but we have to take into account that when we talk about a God who knows all and sees all and is aware of all, he's very deliberate in how he does things. And we're going to see that today when we look at this passage because it's going to be for the maximum effect of making sure that the church is being established, the gospel is being preached, and there are some things we need to see here that are going to be taking place in this particular section. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get into the Lord, into the prayer, uh, prayer section of this uh, uh, program, and we'll go ahead and get started with uh, the word right after that. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that you've given us now to Look to you, Lord, as we read your word and rely upon the Spirit to give us the interpretation and the statement that you want us to understand from what we're reading. Lord, we know that um, you are indeed present. May we be present now with you as we hear you speak to us. We thank you, Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, everybody, let's turn your Bibles and electronic devices to Acts chapter 8. We're going to be reading verses 14 through 25. That's Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 25. This passage is picking up where we left off at the end of uh, the beginning of Acts chapter 8. But now we're going to see some activity here, and it's going to include the rhetoric. In the first part, we're talking about the, the Samaritans and uh, the activity in Samaria. And the second part of this is going to be talking about Simon the sorcerer, which we were alluding to last week and looking at uh, his character and who he is. And it's pretty heavy-duty stuff. It, it would, I would hope that as we look at this, this passage and look at this material here that we'll think very carefully about, without us pointing fingers at other people, but looking directly at ourselves about where we are in our relationship with Jesus and making sure that we indeed have one because that's what this is all about. So let's read verse 14, Acts chapter 8, all the way through to verse 25. Reading from the New Living Translation, please follow along in your version. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 17, then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers and they received the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given, when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. Let me have this power too, he exclaimed, so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, but Peter replied, may your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this, for your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts, for I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and are held captive by sin. Verse 24, pray to the Lord for me. Simon exclaimed that these terrible things you've said won't happen to me. After testifying and preaching the word of the Lord in Samaria, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem. And they stopped in many Samaritan villages along the way to preach the good news. 
Okay, that's Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 25. Two sections here to cover, and we'll see that um, a lot of this content here that we're going to be talking about really isn't going to be the first four verses here that we've read, verses 14 through 17. First of all, we look back at the passage, go back to verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. Now, what Peter and John were doing, because the word had gotten out about Samaria, they were going to try to verify and make sure that these believers were indeed believers. The people who we recognize, when we call someone a believer, that means that person has acknowledged Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and the Spirit comes. But I'm going to challenge you with something here that's going to be very interesting. It doesn't make the fact that these people believed any less authentic. But God is being very deliberate here when he talks about the Samaritans. I want you to take a look. I want you to go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Now, we've discussed this, I believe, last week, if I'm not mistaken. But I want you to go back to this, and I want you to see how deliberate the Lord is. This is right, right before he ascended into heaven. One of the last messages he had about the Spirit coming. But I want you to look at this very carefully. Verse 8, Acts chapter 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, Samaria is being deliberately mentioned here. Let's go back and remember what we were dealing with when we were talking about Samaria. Samaria, Samaritans and Jews did not get along at all. And we've got to understand that when we're talking about literally a missionary situation where we're going to a, well, let's just call it a foreign land, even though it was in Israel within the, the realms of nearby Jerusalem, we're still talking about a foreign land to the point that people hated the Samaritans so much they would literally go around Samaria to avoid traveling through it if they had to go anywhere else past that place. So this is a very deliberate statement that Jesus is making about Samaria. Samaria has to have a special look for what's taking place here. And that's what we need to see about this. These Jewish Christians, even the apostles, Peter and John specifically, they were still not quite sure whether those Gentiles, those non-Jews, those half-Jews, whatever you want to call them, were they're the Samaritans, but they're the ones who we know they're a, mixed, they're a mixed breed of Jews. And we're talking about Jews that were of the lower class by their standards with other, uh, other people. So they weren't highly regarded for that reason either. It's almost like they were a lower class status of uh, people, the way they were looked at. And that's, you know, unfortunately, we, we have classism. <laughs> classism takes place all the time. And it even took place even back then when we're looking at this scripture. And it wasn't until we frankly see that not only this, were Samaria being picked out in addition to that, but Peter is still learning about this thing he's doing. He is still in training himself, and I'll explain why I'm saying that in a moment. He is going to still have an experience we're going to be reading about later in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. And he is going to learn now that in addition to Paul, later on after this, Peter is going to see the importance of understanding that everyone can come to a faith, whether Jew or Gentile. He's going to see the same realization, but he's learning this now. Because remember, he was raised as a Jewish person, and he didn't like Samaritans just like all the rest of them did. So now he's going to be learning something in this process. And the apostles had to be fully convinced, fully convicted, that the Holy Spirit was not just for the Jews, but for all people. So even in this fact that Peter was being given this huge responsibility to be the foundation of the church, 
In order for the Samaritans to be accepted in this church, guess what? He had to be present. He had to be available. He had to speak and make sure the authenticity of this faith, this trust that these people had in Jesus. And that's what we're going to learn here. And understand that this is what's really important for us to see. They, there was really a hating, a hateful relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. And this was a barrier that needed to be broken and crossed for the church to grow. Because if they didn't do this, it was always going to be one section, one, one type of a sect, just like any other type of a faith. Let's go back to the top, Acts chapter 8, verse 15. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not come yet come upon any of men, any of them, excuse me, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, isn't that interesting? So we're talking about the Spirit for whatever reason, I, I can't, it's much too deeper for me to get into right now than that. The actual spirit was withheld temporarily. Even though those people were being projected as believers. And it's also a lesson that's going to be coming here too when we get to Simon on this. But this was about making sure that this new group of Samaritans was not going to be kept out of the church when the it was the authentic message was received and they laid the hands on the believers and received the holy spirit now think about this very carefully now peter and john being jews laying hands on samaritans laying hands on samaritans that's pretty wild if you really think about it i mean that's almost like the equivalent of having people who are Jews laying their hands, like if you want to compare it to like the people of Nazi Germany or something like that. We're talking about a huge thing that's taking place here. And at the end of the day, Peter had to see that the Lord was working in these people, just like the Lord had been working in him and working in others as well too. So this is a big deal. And that was the first sign that Peter had that these people did indeed have the authentic faith that they had, that they too were believers just like they were. But they had to be the ones that were part of this whole thing about making sure that believers indeed come from all lands, all places, not just in Jerusalem. Remember, they were scattered. They were scattered because of all the persecution, so they would have to go out to other lands and see what was going on. I want you to take a look at Acts chapter 6. We're going to go back to Acts 6 for a moment. A lot of this information that I'm pulling from is from Acts because we need to see that this whole thing about the Spirit being present the apostles had to be the ones to be involved in the laying of hands on people to make sure that they were receiving the faith. And that's what we're going to see here in Acts chapter 6. Uh, Acts 6, verse 6. And I'm going to read a comment on this afterward. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. Laying their hands on them was a way for those individuals, the apostles, to be actively involved with making sure that people were being converted to the faith in Jesus Christ. And we would have to associate this laying of the hands on people with the presence of the Spirit because that was kind of what was associated with it. So this whole idea of laying hands on the Sumerians, um, John MacArthur calls that the apostolic affirmation and solidarity recognizing that we're talking about people now being welcomed into the church. If there were Samaritans who wanted to travel to Jerusalem and come to their church, they could be welcomed right in because they pretty much affirmed that with this action that they did here in the passage we're reading. And remember when I said that Peter 
was still learning. This is all amazing to him too, I'm sure, right? You don't have his immediate reaction right here, but I want you to, let's peek ahead to Acts chapter 10. Go to Acts chapter 10. I want you to see how this whole thing about the Spirit coming and the presence of the Spirit coming is something that, of course, only God has control over. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 47. So we're, we're kind of bumping ahead to a future reading here. And if you have your heading in your Bible, what does it say? Your heading in your Bible might say, The Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles. In the same manner, when we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, of the Holy Spirit coming down with tongues like flames of fire, because it was promised by Jesus that it would come, let's read through verses 44 through 47. Even as Peter was saying these things, look at this. The Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. This was his encounter with Cornelius. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. We're breaking barriers here, everybody. There are barriers that are being broken. Now, God doesn't have these barriers. We are the ones who have the barriers that need to be broken. Verse 46, for they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. What happened in Acts chapter 2? People were speaking in other tongues and praising God. Verse, uh, the rest of the verse, then Peter asked, can anyone object to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? Peter had to learn, even if you read earlier in this chapter, about what God calls clean. Just because we call them unclean, we need to back up and say, wait a minute, God's calling it clean. He was teaching Peter a lesson. We are not to have barriers between people because the Holy Spirit is for everyone. And that's what needed to be taught here. And that's why we need to recognize that it was fine for Peter and John to go to Samaria and preach the gospel, lay the hands on the Samaritans, but there was a lesson that they had to learn too. All believers, all believers, all people who believe in Jesus Christ will receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is, this is a special opportunity for us to understand something here. God was very deliberate in delaying the Spirit for those people for the purpose of making sure that when Peter and John, two of the apostles, came in front of them, that they would recognize the importance of seeing the Spirit come on these people. And it was a way to solidify the church. Solidify the church. Our church today is supposed to be made up of what? All believers. Black, white, Hispanic, Asian, doesn't matter who it is. And that's what's being communicated here, even to Peter and John. Remember, they were getting a little comfortable because they were just spending time in Jerusalem. They had to get out and see other places. And when Jesus says first, you know, Jesus says Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth, which is what we talk about here in the Alliance, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, is talking about everywhere now. So we had to do it step by step, didn't we? Jerusalem, he literally went in order. Jerusalem, Judea, when I say who, he, Jesus. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Because after Samaria, that's when things really exploded. And when we get to the bottom of this passage here and we look at the end of this, we're going to see how they went back through Samaria to all the little towns in between to preach the good news. Here are Jews walking through Samaria which for many hundreds of years was a foreign territory that no one who was Jewish wanted to go through. And when we look at this section in verses 14 through 17 in Acts chapter 8, this was a special moment of history, much like when the Spirit was dispensed that we read about in Acts chapter 2, 
and what we read about here in Acts chapter 10. These are special moments that many scholars think are taking place here. And it's the good news being spread through Samaria. And the believers who were preaching there, the ones who went in, Philip first, doesn't diminish what Philip did, by the way. Philip preached the good news. But we know that we have the confidence today that we don't have to have a special way of treatment here. The moment you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior in your life, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling within you. But we have to separate and recognize that this was a special event. This is something that had to take place in the manner that it did so that we would see the authenticity of the conversion of the Samaritans and have the church recognize it. If we don't have this confirmation or authenticity of this conversion, they would separate the Samaritans and say, well, you go to your church over here. We're going to do our church over here. That is not what God intends. That's never what God intended. And he doesn't want that to be the case for us either. God knows our biases. And God knows where we are when it comes to our own track of understanding faith. Even Peter was learning something from this experience in Acts chapter 8. Something new. Something different at that time. And so that's why even later on we see in Acts chapter 10, this whole pouring out of the Spirit. While Peter was speaking, the Spirit was coming down. And all of the people with Peter, not just Peter, but all the people who were Jews traveling with Peter to see Cornelius, the centurion, they were amazed at what they saw. You know that the Lord has a way of really making an impact, sometimes by just being utterly amazing. Utterly amazing. Doing something that's not expected not understood right away, but man, when, you, when it happens, it knocks your socks off. And we got to see that, that this, is, this is what's happening here in this passage in Acts chapter 8. So the uncircumcised Gentiles could now receive the good news, could now understand what it is to be saved, could now have the presence of the Holy Spirit and can now learn and grow with that understanding. And now we know why it was so important for this to happen the way it did. Like I said, Philip did the work. He laid the groundwork. He did what was necessary to speak to these people and teach them the good news. And we have to separate this event from what we understand today about what the Holy Spirit does. When you become a believer, the Holy Spirit's right there right away. It's not a delay. It's not a time element involved with that. Now, I'm going to challenge everybody to keep, keep an open mind here and look at this from the standpoint that we got Simon here. Now we're going to talk about in verse 18. And this is going to be very interesting. Remember, just to give you a little bit of background about Simon, Simon was in Samaria... He was there for many years performing basically sorcery, witchcraft, performing signs and miracles and so that he could be elevated to a place where he was called godlike. What does that sound like? What did Satan want? He wanted to be like God. And so... Simon was eating this up. He loved the attention. He loved this whole aspect of, you know, and I'm sure he did get money for all of this power that he was exhibiting because people would come to him and probably ask him to do something. He'd do it, probably got paid for it. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the character of Simon who was hanging around with Philip, following Philip around as Philip was doing all these wonderful things. Let's go to verse 18. So we pick up with Simon again after we saw this introduction earlier in the chapter. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given when the apostles laid their hands on people, 
he offered them money to buy this power. Let me have this power too, he exclaimed, so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. For him to utter something like that, to come out of his mouth, you know, the first thing I think about is that, where is that lightning bolt coming from heaven to take him out? But we, needed to, we need to see this play out all the way through. And I'll explain why in a moment. Let me have this power too. Let me have this power. Now, let's just say Simon's an idiot. All right? Because he doesn't understand that this is not a game. A lot of people try to treat being a believer or Christianity as a game. And it's a game in a way for them to get attention. And I got to watch how I say this. But when we see Simon's behavior, it also can be indicative of the behavior of a lot of people that we see today or have seen today, some living, some dead, that were wanting attention and getting money for it rather than really standing on the gospel. Because it's not about what you believe or do, it's about what he has done for you. And rather than personalizing and say, it's about me, it's about me, it's about me, we have to fight our own egos sometimes. And remember, it's about Jesus. I mean, the motivation about having the power, it's not about what God is doing for you to give you the power. It's about you dying to self and living for him. And let's face it, Philip had a special ability that God gave to him through the Spirit. Jesus had that same ability to do the things that he did to perform miracles because of the Spirit. Peter and John were given special abilities by Jesus when they became the apostles to reach people. And, and of course, it was at the, the, the beckonings of the Spirit that this was done. It wasn't anything in their ability. It was because the Spirit did it for them. There's no money involved in that. Simon thought he could buy the Holy Spirit. This power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that in certain, some churches, some settings, no names, it's all about money flowing through. It's all about cash flow. And, you know, sometimes it's just not really that great to have the biggest churches out there. For that reason. Sometimes it's really a good idea that these churches stay small. So it humbles people, frankly. God sustains those churches, the ones that are truly in the faith, with not a lot of money. But when money gets involved, money is corrupting. Money has a way of corrupting us. So let's go back to the passage. Verse 20. Peter, but Peter replied, May your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. I want to challenge you with something. Peter just met this Simon for the first time. Remember, he's been in Samaria. Simon's been in Samaria. Peter's been in Jerusalem. Met him for the first time. The Holy Spirit is giving Peter the words to use to give us a picture of of Simon's true character. Let's read on. Verse 21, you can have no part in this, for your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord, perhaps he will forgive your evil, evil thoughts. For I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and are held captive by sin. Now we see what Simon's all about. Outwardly, he wants all the attention he can get. Ego-driven. Very much wants to be seen in the limelight. 
It's okay if he's in Philip's shadow and walking behind him. He wants to have the same ability Philip has to, as Philip is walking through and people are getting healed and the spirit is working. He wants that same thing too. But Jesus, pardon me, the Holy Spirit is not going to be resting anywhere near a person like Simon because he's evil. He's wicked. What is, what is Peter saying here? Your, your heart's not right with God. You say you believe. He believed who Jesus was, but he did not believe in Jesus you have to make a distinction between the two. Of course, he knows about who Jesus is. There's a lot of folks out in the world today who don't follow Jesus Christ. They know who he is, but they don't believe in him as far as what he did on the cross for them. And this guy is just a grifter, Simon. He just wants to hang on. To, to Philip's coattails. He wants to be able to say, yes, I can do this too. Because he wants all the attention. Peter was right to tell him like it is. May your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. This is the cautionary tale. People who talk about getting involved with ministry for money, Stay away from them. Amen? Amen? Stay away from them. Because this is not about money. It's about Jesus. Now, if you are blessed because somebody gives you something in association with what you do, but usually it's a gift for the church. It's not for you. So we have to see this behavior for what it truly is. And... You guys can stay tuned in about a couple of weeks when I preach because it's going to be about Simon anyway. Just letting you know uh, to go even more in depth with that and follow this up with additional scriptures to show how someone like Simon the sorcerer is flying in the face of scripture all day long. All day long. And we have to see these two different examples that we've seen here in this passage about how the Samaritans are truly getting saved, but there's one Samaritan there who truly isn't saved, and it's because of his motivations. And that's what we need to learn here. You cannot buy your salvation. No amount of money that you have. The richest people in the world, you can't buy salvation. You can't buy God's forgiveness. Remember what they used to practice in the early church? For those of you who are in the church history class we did, this was, I'm going to test your memory bank here a little bit. When the, the Catholic church was formed, there was a lot of ways where people could walk up to the pastor or the priest and ask for forgiveness of sin by just giving them some money. Just dropping something in the, in the, in the box or whatever it is, and, and that priest or whoever it was who had the power to do so say, yes, your sins are forgiven. That was the early church. We need to talk about the early church <laughs> and recognize that we're talking about human beings who were flawed, who were involved in this church. This early church we're talking about. Because money corrupts people. That's why I'm emphasizing this. Just drop something, a little something in the box, you know, do your little confession, whatever it is, and you can walk away and say, hey, God's forgiven your sin albeit falsely, <laughs> but that's what they believed at that time, and that's what they did. And the bottom line is that that person was no further or closer to the Lord than he was when he walked up before he dropped the money in the till. Satan has a way, this was pointed out to me when I was reading something very, very important to see here. Satan has a way of corrupting from within. You know, remember when he tried to persecute the believers, all that did was just spread the church. <laughs> you know, that's all it did. You know, Saul was unwittingly spreading the church everywhere, chasing people out of town, out of Jerusalem into other lands. And Saul had to have his 
own conversion take place where God had to speak to him and teach him something. But Simon was acting out of selfishness. He wanted more power, more prestige. What does Satan want? More power, more prestige. He doesn't need money. Money is used as a tool. And when we have the gifts of the Spirit, when we have what God gives us as our abilities to serve, it's not about so much making us better, but making us better for Christ. It's what we do for Jesus. The gifts and abilities that he gives to us. It's what he does to glor it's what we do to glorify God. It's not about glorifying ourselves. Please let me be the lowliest person. <laughs> I mean, that's the way I feel about it. It's like I'm just here to do the best I can do to just share the word. But he's to be glorified. And I like this comment here. When you find yourself wishing for an ability that would put you into the limelight or somehow enrich you personally, check your motives. Check your motives. Now, let me, let me just be very clear about it. We're, we're human beings. We're fleshly. We sometimes think in those terms. We do. I mean, we think that way sometimes. And it's not so much about what I can do for Christ. Sometimes it's about because it, it will elevate you in some way. But this is exactly why we pray for our leaders. We pray for our people. We pray for the leader of our country. We pray for the leader of our city, state, all the people who are in leadership because they are facing all kinds of stuff, attacks, whatever it is. And we pray for our pastors because they get all kinds of attacks. And that's why I, I like when I hear the word, I'm just a servant for Jesus. Because a servant is ultimately what you are. You are a servant. You are serving the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You are. You might be a pastor, you might, but you're a servant. Because you're serving the Lord. Everything you're doing is on behalf of the glory of God. At the end of the day, everything we do is for God's glory. There's no exceptions to that. So let's go to verse 24. I wanted to cover this... <laughs> Here's Simon. I want you to hear what he says in response to what Peter said. This is the cautionary tale that's coming up here. Pray to the Lord for me. Oh, Lord. How many times have we heard this? Other people say this. And I have to think about this for what it truly is. Pray to the Lord for me. Simon exclaimed that these terrible things you've said won't happen to me. And that's where we end the dialogue with Simon. Pray to the Lord for me. Now, is there such a thing where praying for someone else is effective? Sure. I mean, because um, in Job, you'll remember that God told Job to, you know, to have, he's going to have them pray, him pray for those people who God was very unhappy with, by the way, for giving Job such terrible advice. Not the young guy, but the three others. And yes, that worked. <laughs> it helped to spare them probably their lives. And at the end of the day, yeah, having someone, you know, if someone asks you to pray for them, go ahead and do so. But we also need to instruct them, listen, you need to pray to God yourself for forgiveness. That's exactly what Peter told him. Repent of your wickedness. Truly repent of your wickedness. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts. Because Simon operated out of jealousy. Simon operated in a sinful way. He was literally held captive. He was literally imprisoned mentally by the sin he was in. Remember, we're talking about a years-long habit of wanting all kinds of attention 
and he was committing sorcery. So he was in camp with, with Satan all the way. Would his heart change? Just like when we hear the commercial about how many licks does it take to, to get to the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop? One, two, three, three. Well, the world may never know. And in this case, we don't really know what happened with Simon. We don't have a conclusion to this. It's been left open-ended. Same thing happened to Jonah, left open-ended at the end of the, the book. But we knew he was a preacher. But Simon ain't no preacher. We don't know. Well, let's look at verse 25. We'll close out here. After testifying and preaching the word of the Lord in Samaria, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem. And they stopped in many Samaritan villages along the way to preach the good news. Ladies and gentlemen, this is unchartered territory for the church. This is a new thing. Samaria? Going through the towns and villages, going back to Jerusalem. Not taking the long way around, but going right back through directly to Jerusalem and stopping in the different towns along the way to preach the good news. That's why this whole event about the Spirit being delayed for the purposes of Peter and John, they had to see the Spirit was going to fall on these people because they believed. A special deliverance of the Spirit. So we learn some things here from this. As we go through ministry, Peter and John going through it, they're learning just as we're learning each day as we go through our ministry. We don't know everything. We're still learning things. And Peter and John, we're still learning things here too. Their learning started the moment they said, come with, you know, when the Lord said, come with me. And I'll make you fishers of men. And that's how it is with us too. Come with me and I'll make you fishers of men. But we're going to be learning stuff along the way as we do it. And the Lord's going to overwhelm us with wonder as we do it. Because being a believer in Jesus Christ should never be boring. Never be boring. If it is boring, that's where you have to circle back and say, Lord, refresh in my spirit. Speak to me personally about where I am in this. Doesn't matter how old you are, by the way. Lord, wash me anew and afresh. It shouldn't be boring. And if it is boring, don't let Satan fool you. Because he wants you to feel like it's not worth the effort. It's not worth the time to do these things. I'm telling you, you should learn something from this passage alone about how Peter and John, they were full up in it. They were doing the work, but they were now doing something they not, never probably thought they would do. But Jesus told them they would. Now they had to see it for themselves. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this message that you've given to us. And Lord, may we take it to heart that indeed our authenticity with you starts with us and believing in who you are and what you have done for us. Lord, if there is any doubt in anyone's heart, speak to that person right now. Help that person to recognize that without you going to the cross, rising from the dead, we wouldn't have anything. And we thank you for this teaching, Lord. Bless us and keep us as we go. Help us to see that even as we're in ministry, we're still learning things as we go. And Lord, may we always be in that manner. 
We thank you for this time in your word. Bless us and keep us, Lord. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here for another edition of Live Stream Sunday School for Akron Alliance Fellowship Church in Akron, Ohio. We appreciate you joining us today. God bless you and take care of yourselves. We'll see you around the corner and see you next time. Take care.